This painting at Kiplin in the tea room is of Christopher Crowe, and he's here because in 1722 he bought Kiplin Hall from his stepson Charles Calvert, who was the fifth Lord Baltimore, and he lived here until he died in 1747. The portrait shows him in an Italian landscape. It was painted by Francesco Trevisani in Italy. He's pointing to some Roman ruins, and in his hand, he's holding a Roman intaglio or seal, and perhaps he actually collected things like that. He's not wearing his wig, he's wearing his soft hat, so he's a sort of connoisseur of antiquities. He was British consul in Livorno or Leghorn near Florence on the coast from 1705 to 1715. And while he was there, he was also a merchant. He supplied the British fleet in the Mediterranean with wine and olive oil. He had five trading ships. He made a lot of money. And he also helped young Milordi on their grand tour. So again, he will have made money through that. In Italy, he also acted as an agent for supplying works of art to noblemen in this country. And among them was the Duke of Marlborough, who um, ordered four bronze sculptures after the antique for his new salon at Blenheim Palace, which Christopher then shipped off to him. And he actually, it's recorded in his wonderful ledger of all, all his um, ships going out and, and where they were going and what they were carrying. This is Christopher Crowe's ledger from his time in Livorno and it records all the ships that he sent out and what their cargo was. And you can see here in 1711, this is what he supplied to the Duke of Marlborough. Of course, it's all in French, so Le Duc du Marlborough. And he sent out sculptures by Soldani Bensi. And you can see they cost a thousand pounds, which was a lot. And then he also had to pay the freight of getting them to Blenheim Palace and we've got here the statues of bronze and that was 66 pounds 13 shillings and a penny in 1711 it was probably quite a lot of money in Livorno Christopher Crowe met Lady Charlotte Lee now she was the granddaughter of King Charles II and one of his mistresses Barbara Villiers who was a very powerful lady and, and had a, a large number of children Charlotte had been married to Benedict Calvert, the fourth Lord Baltimore, George Calvert's great-grandson, and she had eight children in seven years. She produced twins, which is how she managed to fit in quite so many. But they separated, they started divorce proceedings, and she went off to Italy with one of her lovers and had several more children. She then met Christopher Crowe in Livorno, and her husband died just then, which was very fortunate, and Christopher Crowe married her in 1715. They had four children, so she'd had at least 14 or 16 children altogether. And they moved back to England, to Woodford in Essex. And sadly, she died after only six years of marriage in 1721. The death certificate says arthritis, but I suspect it was just exhaustion and poor medical care in the 18th century. But Christopher Crowe never married again, and I think it was a real love match. There are things at Kipling which remind us of um, Christopher's wife, Lady Charlotte Lee. One is a jewellery box or a strong box, which is said to have been given to her by Charles II and has been kept here at Kipling. But also a rather strange item, which is a large block of oak. And an old family label says that it was part of the block of oak on which Charles I was beheaded. Some visitors say they can see blood on it, but I'm not sure about that. Christopher brought Kiplin in 1722 and he paid £7,000, which is about £800,000 in today's money. The Crows were um, sort of rising landed gentry, it was a, almost a new class in society here. And Kiplin was a bit old fashioned when he arrived here, it was 100 years old, and so he began modernising and he put in ceiling mouldings and dado rails and Georgian fireplaces and also a grand central staircase, which you could waft down rather than them being in the tower. He also built external kitchens and a service wing and then he opened up the space between the fireplaces on the first floor um, to create a corridor or servant's tunnel which joins the hall through the north tower and meant the servants could come in to the house from the service wing without going through the family rooms.
Christopher Crowe would recognise some of the items from his collection, which are still here at Kipton Hall. And one of them is this wonderful Chinese Chippendale cabinet. And he brought these little panels of pietra dura, literally hard stone, coloured stones and marbles and things, from Livorno. They were made for tourists over there. And they show little scenes of the Italian countryside, little villas with cypress trees and flags and things. They're absolutely delightful. And either he or his son commissioned the cabinet to house them and also presumably to house his collections, perhaps Italian seals or coins or even documents because behind each scene, each one has a little lock, there is a drawer or a cupboard to keep precious items. And it is possible that the central panel here may be Livorno itself because Livorno has a bay with an island and a castle and this here indeed has a bay with an island and a castle. So it would be very suitable for the centre of his fabulous cabinet. Some of Christopher Crowe's collection, their items are in various rooms at Kipton Hall. In the library there are two paintings of Venetian courtesans by an Italian artist Bartolomo Nazare. But here in the dining room, he put in the fireplace and the painting above. The fireplace has the cornucopia or the horns of plenty spilling out grapes and walnuts and things so it's perfect for a dining room and at the same time he put in this ornate plaster frame for one of the paintings he bought. It's by a Flemish artist called Bukala and it dates from 1568, one of the oldest paintings at Kiplan and he collected that presumably in the lowlands as he came back through from Italy to England. And Bukala paints scenes of markets, usually with food and peasants. And again, very suitable for a dining room. You've got chickens and fish and then great big cheeses. So it, it makes a very fine ensemble. And it's, the painting has been here since the 1720s when Christopher Crowe brought it to Kiplan, which is rather wonderful. When Christopher Crowe was British Consul in Livorno, he commissioned at least four paintings of Venice, possibly six or eight, from um, an artist who was a predecessor of Canaletto called Luca Carlovarus. He was excellent at painting architecture, but particularly focused on people, whereas Canaletto really stuck to architecture more. And this is the only one that still survives at Kiplan. Others have been sold through the centuries, but it's really beautiful and it is a wonderful view of a carnival in Venice. You can see people wearing carnival masks. This lady has a, a black mask and some of the aristocrats are wearing white masks. There's also a play going on here and people leaning out over the balconies looking out onto the crowd and if you really look at the people it is absolutely fantastic the detail. This gentleman here is looking out at the artist or at the viewer in fact and very puzzled as to why people are looking at him and the dogs are fantastic. There's also in the centre the man in red, Bridget Talbot, the last owner of Kipton, always said was Christopher Crowe himself. Now the painting of him downstairs shows him as quite a slender young man and this to me looks like a, an older more corpulent gentleman but so I don't know if it really was but it's a good story and Bridget always liked a good story. Christopher Crowe and his descendants continued to buy land at Kipton and it went up from about 800 acres to about 4,500 acres in the 18th century. He or his son also dammed the Kipton Beck uh, and created a serpentine lake to the west of the house which flowed right down to the old mill down to the south. It was on the flat part of the lawn and was fed by Kipton Beck itself. He also planted lots of trees in the parkland and probably his son, uh, more than Christopher Crowe himself, created a wonderful walled garden where a lot of the produce for the tea room comes from now.
This painting by George Kewitt dates from 1780 and it's wonderful because it shows Kiplan in its landscape with just a gravel path running around the house. The cattle could come right down to the front door. The Serpentine Lake runs to the west of the house behind it and here's Christopher Crowe's oak standing almost as tall as the house on a slight rise there. Christopher Crowe the Younger may have built the little Gothic style folly which you can see across the modern lake, that's a 1990s quarrying lake. Um, it may date from 1750, but on the other hand it could have been built by the Earl of Tyrconnell when he built the Gothic drawing room in the 1820s. Nobody is certain about that. Christopher Crowe the Younger also became known for being uh, a farmer and an agricultural experimenter with a lot of innovations in various aspects of farming. And Arthur Young, who was a, a, an author and a, um, an expert on agriculture, came on a six-month tour through the north of England in 1768, and he actually stayed at Kipton for two weeks. And there are 40 pages in his book about Christopher Crowe the Younger's farming at Kipton and all his different techniques and things. He was a great one for rotating crops and using hedges to protect crops. Uh, one of my favourite quotes, I have to say, from Arthur Young is, um, in the management of his manure, this very spirited gen gentleman is likewise very attentive. And I always like to think of, of Christopher Crowe being attentive to his manure, but I'm sure they, uh, the fertilisation of the fields made a great difference. He also grew cabbages, um, and it says in 1765 that uh, the cabbages, the average, were 20 pounds in weight or 42 pounds. Now those are gigantic cabbages and he wasn't feeding them to his guests. He was actually using them to feed livestock through the winter, whereas his tenants often slaughtered their livestock because they couldn't feed them through the winter. He was experimenting with different ways. There's also a great diatribe in Arthur Young about turnips and he starts the mention of turnips reminds me of the very bad common husbandry of this country relative to turnips, viz. the not hoeing them. And he goes on and on about the farmers not doing their duty and hoeing their turnips. And in fact, the year after Arthur Young was here in 1769, we have a silver cup at Kipton which was given for the best field of turnips completely hoed. Christopher Crowe the Younger was also involved in the local militia in the area and he was known as a queller of riots. In 1757 he was called on to quell a riot of Swaledale and Wensleydale miners who were protesting at the price of corn and he went off with about 600 horsemen and um, quelled the riot and he was given the freedom of Richmond to show the appreciation of the town and also a silver gilt tobacco box which is rather lovely and is still here at Kiplan Hall. And it says the date, um, 1757, and Christopher Crowe the Younger. But what really amuses me about this gift is that the name of the mayor, Christopher Wayne, is in huge letters in the bottom. Um, and Christopher Crowe the Younger is in much smaller letters. I'm not sure how he felt about that. In 1761, he led the militia against the rioting pitmen in Hexham. And unfortunately, in the fray that followed, two soldiers and 38 pitmen were killed. So a serious riot. Christopher Crowe married Barbara Duncan of Duncan Park near Helmsley, but they had no children, and so his brother George inherited Kipling when Christopher died in 1776. George only owned it, owned it for about eight years, but he seemed to carry on the family interest in horticulture, because in the library there's a book signed by George Crowe, a treatise on the culture of the pineapple and the management of the hothouse. It was printed in 1779, um, and the pineapples were very exotic at that time, so I wonder whether he actually grew any here at Kipton. It would be lovely to know. Another remarkable book in the library at Kipton is George Crowe's Family Bible, which was actually printed in 1752. And in the front, he has pasted in, I don't know if it was him or, or his wife who wrote it, but he records their wedding day in 1754 and the birth of each of their three children, Robert, George and Barbara. And then at the bottom, something that I find absolutely remarkable, and I was astonished when I read it, and it says Scruton, which is a village nearby. Saturday the 16th of March, 1765, Robert, George and Barbara Crowe were inoculated. So they were actually vaccinated against smallpox in 1765 in a tiny village. 
nearby, which is, is really wonderful to know. George Crow's elder son Robert inherited Kipton when his father died and he continued the family tradition of being involved with the local militia. And he was captain of the troop of the Kipton and Langton Yeomanry Cavalry during the Napoleonic Wars between 1703 and 1714. And it was a bit like Dad's army, they were prepared to fight should Napoleon invade with his troops, but they never saw service. We also have what is probably Robert Crow's sabre, and it's wonderfully engraved um, all along the blade, and even down the bottom has a little cavalry officer charging, holding his sabre. But when the, the troop was disbanded in 1714, the men gave Robert Crow this wonderful silver gilt cup with a little cavalry officer charging here on top, and there's an inscription on the front of the cup which reads, the cup was unanimously presented to Robert Crow, Esquire of Kiplan, Captain Commandant of the Kiplan Troop of Yeomanry Cavalry, by the members thereof, as a testimony of personal regard and approval of his conduct during their united services of 10 years, which becoming no longer requisite, were terminated on the 5th day of April, 1814. That's a lot of inscribing for the person working on this cup.